Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Terry, and I'm an alcoholic. Well, I'm obviously very, very excited to be here and get this thing underway, right? Hello, Puerto Vallarta. Oh my God, I can't believe I can't believe I'm here. Like I can't believe like this is my life. Like that we get to do this, that we get to come together in a beautiful place like this and celebrate recovery and sobriety and uh, just an honor and a blessing. And uh, a couple of housekeeping items. You know, I, w- I was sitting there with Carla before we got started. Before I tried to come up earlier. You know, I've, I've had people ask me, you know, do you get nervous? I'm like, yeah, like the, especially the first five minutes sitting in the hot seat and any opportunity to spring up out of that thing will work for me. And, uh, obviously. And so, um, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous and, uh, but my sponsor always says that's a good sign of humility. Um, that that's just God shaking the truth out of you. So. A couple more minutes, we'll get this thing going. And uh, so today, though, so Mark and Carla gave a great talk on the 12 traditions. If you weren't here, did they not? And what I loved the most about the way they did it was uh, she gave us the AA recollection, that, that kind of side of it. And then Mark gave us the Al-Anon spin on it. And, uh, man, I just got a lot out of that. And I just want to thank you. That was really, really awesome. And so... Being the kickoff speaker, that there's a lot to be said for this, okay, being the first to go. Uh, and I had a choice. It was the weirdest thing. So, um, you know, I get this invitation, and I'm like, uh, they're like, is your schedule, are you available? And I'm like, if I'm not, I will make myself available. I will figure that part out. And then they were like, what would you like to speak Friday or Saturday? And I'm like, gosh, nobody's ever asked me that. Like, um, I don't know. I go, ask Carla what she wants, and I'll take the other one. <laughs> then they were like, we've already asked Carla, and she said, she'll take whatever one you don't take. <laughs> I swear to God. And so I'm like, well, I'm not going to give myself the Saturday night speaker. And then, you know, being first, then you get it ticked off the box, right? And so I said, well, I'll take Friday night. So here I am, and I'm just delighted to be here. Everybody has been so kind, and I know there's a lot of hard work that goes into these conferences. Uh, there's a lot going on in the background, and there's months and months of preparation, and then we all come together, and we have this great time. And uh, just to be here, um, I've never been here before. It's incredibly beautiful down here. And uh, so for the people that live here, uh, lucky you, right? <laughs> lucky you. And uh, so anyway, um, let's get into some of the meat and potatoes. Um, my sobriety date is October the 17th, 1993. I have a home group, the Woodville Saturday Night, as Bill sees it. I have a sponsor. Her name is Janet F. Um, and I sponsor women. I actively attend Alcoholics Anonymous. I set up tables and chairs, and I make coffee, and I greet people at the door. And, you know, I've been, I'm 30 years into this thing, and I still do the basic meat and potatoes of Alcoholics Anonymous um, because I want... Um, I want what you have. I want to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, And then the blessings come, right? So things just keep getting better. I keep showing up. Things keep getting better. And I need to keep showing up because my head, like, it's it's like a dangerous place to be. (laughs) I mean, if I go a week without a meeting, I really do. Like, I just, I feel myself a little squirrely. And uh, when I come into a room, especially at a meeting back home, like on the Saturday night meeting, just walking in the door, I just, there's like an exhale, like... (sighs) I'm home, you know, I'm around my people. There's something about being in that room with that group of people. And there's something about being in places like this. So um, I'm blessed to be here. So let me tell you my story. Okay, that's why they brought me here. What is my story? What? Oh, my God. So my story's tragic. Um, it's a sad story. And um, though you might not think so, um, I do. Um, <laughs> it's tragic for me. And... Um, you know, I grew up in a small town, uh, Woodville, Ohio, is just east of Toledo. Uh, in the 1970s, when I grew up, there was not a lot happening in Woodville, Ohio. Um, we played hide-and-seek. Uh, we went to the swimming pool in the summertime. That's where I met my husband, Eric. Thank you for coming with me, sweetie. Uh, that's him in the front row. And um, a little shout-out. I forgot about my husband. Like, how do you do that? I'm sorry, sweetie. Um, so anyway... 
I grew up in this little town where everybody knows everybody, a little community of 2,000 people. And that's a nice place to raise kids. Um, and I didn't get into a lot of trouble, but I can tell you, growing up in Woodville, I always knew that there was something different about me. There was something about me. I just couldn't put my finger on it, but I, didn't, I never felt like I, like I fit in. I always felt like I was a round peg trying to squeeze into a square hole. Like I just didn't ever seem to fit. And you know, growing up in a single-parent home, so my mom was a bartender. So at the end of the school day, when I was coming home from school, my mom was leaving for work. And then she was coming in from work at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning while I was sound asleep. And so when I, when I look back on my childhood, I kind of remember me and my older sister Pam, like, just fighting. <laughs> That's all we did. Like, we just fought. And, um, and I kind of ran the streets of Woodville a little bit. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to get into. But I can tell you the first time that I consumed alcohol, I was probably 15 years old. I might have been 16 but it changed my life, man. It rocked my world. Like, I knew from that very first night that I drank alcohol that uh, I wanted to be, I wanted this feeling all the time. Because what happened was, so when I consumed alcohol, that feeling of not fitting in, that awkwardness, that social, whatever it is, I don't even know what you're, there's got to be a, a name for it if I could talk to a psychologist, but um, I'm sure they'd label it, you know, you're a, you are this. And... Uh, <laughs> It went away. It was gone. I mean, like that, just gone. I And I wanted more of that feeling. And so the, and the first time that I got drunk, actually, and this is noteworthy, uh, I had a blackout. And it's interesting that social drinkers don't have blackouts. Only alcoholics have blackouts. And I had a blackout the very first time I got drunk. Like, who knew? And and I thought I was unique. <laughs> I, one time I was at a conference, and I'm like, anybody else ever have that? And half the room went like this. I was like, oh, my God. Here, I thought I was unique, right? Yeah, no, I'm not unique. And so in the 1970s, and I, would, I started drinking at age 16, I, and, um, you know, I was drinking on the weekends, and I started drinking on Wednesday to break up the middle of the week, and, and somehow I managed to graduate high school. Don't ask me. I don't know. I have always, always done just enough to get by. Just enough to keep that monkey off my back. Just enough. And so I graduated high school. And once I graduated high school, it was on. And I would, um, I was just like the party animal. And I used to keep up with the guys. I was a beer drinker. And my thing, um, I know there's a lot of pretty girls in the room. Um, you ever just want to sit on a bar stool and be cute and let the guys buy you beer all night long? I see heads going like, you come on, girls, you know. And, and that was my MO. Like, that's what I did. And, um, and I would pride myself. I would go into the, the Sycamore Grove, Portage Inn, and I would have 20 bucks in my purse, and I would wake up the next morning, and I'd have 10 or $15 in my purse. And, like, I was there for five or six hours, and that was how I rolled. And so I was a manipulator. Um, I used my good looks. I used my good looks um, back in the day, and uh, I'm not proud of that, but that's just part of my past, part of who I am. And so in my early 20s, um, my my drinking began to affect my life, um, as it always does, and the DUI started to come. And, you know, first you get the slap on the wrist, and which I did from the mayor of Woodville, because uh, it happened in Woodville. And then the second one I ended up, I got um, a three-day weekend where you just listen, and then you go home, and that's the end of that. <laughs> And then it was like three days, and like I just, I just don't learn my lesson, right? Um, because it's my way or the highway, and you can't tell me anything because I already know everything, right? And I don't, I don't listen very well. I don't follow instruction, and uh, and I really don't care. <laughs> Especially if I hurt your feelings. Well, like, I, I, it didn't. Nothing mattered because I was the center of my universe. Okay. And it was all about me, and it was always all about me, and that's the way I rolled. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to fast forward the tape because there's a lot that I want to get to tonight, and we just we just need to get to 1993. So, because <laughs> that's where it all started to unravel. <laughs> so let's get to the bottom of the pit, shall we? So I, I drank. Um, I told you I started at age 16. And I took my last drink at age 28. And for 12 years, 12 years, man, I was a, a raging alcoholic wreaking havoc in other people's lives, unemployable. I was a thief. I was a cheat. I was a liar. Name something, and that was me. 
<clears throat> and so by um, April of 1993, I was in the grips of my alcoholism. I really didn't have any friends. All my friends were men. Like, I had nothing to do with women. I really didn't have, I had like one girlfriend, Debbie. That was about it. And um, anyway, um, I was sitting on a bar stool with my sister, and we were, had actually had been bar hopping. And then uh, about midnight that night, I was sitting on a bar stool, and this guy, Tony, that I was dating, came staggering in the bar, and he was uh, had been drinking. And, of course, I had been drinking for several hours, and he wanted to move to another bar over in Elmore. And he hopped in his Camaro, and I hopped in my Buick with me and my sister, and she was in the passenger seat. And I was following him. Um, there was a good space in between us. I was doing the speed limit. Um, and I was traveling between these two little communities, Woodville and Chenoa. It's about a five-mile drive. And there is one curve on that road, one curve. And it's not even a sharp curve. You don't even have to slow down. You just have to turn your wheels to the right if you're going toward Elmore and just navigate through that curve. And, of course, as I entered into the curve, I was arguing with my sister. And I remember looking at her, I was facing her in the car, and I shouted something at because I had just passed the road to take her home, and she was mad because she was drunk and she wanted to go home, but I knew, see, this is how selfish I am. I knew if I turned on that road to take her home, she, Tony, was not going to end up at the PI. I would probably never see him again for the rest of the night, and I needed to keep his taillights in my sight, right? That's, that's how I used to think, like it was all about me and what I wanted. And so I was arguing with my sister, and right about that time, um, I entered into the curve, on, on, and I never turned my wheels. I just continued to go straight on a forward path. Uh, an oncoming car enters into the curve, and I strike it. Um, I strike the passenger door directly behind the driver is where the point of the first point of impact with my bumper in that car, and they were probably going 55. I know I was, and... Um, the woman, her, her name was Jane Miller. She was driving that car, and she had three teenage boys in that car coming back from a school dance at the high school in Elmore, and her son was asleep. Uh, well, he couldn't have been asleep because they just left Elmore, but he was had his head up on the window like this on that door where uh, my bumper struck, and he died from a head injury that he sustained because of my alcoholism, because of my drinking. <sighs> And so I killed a 14-year-old boy. That's what I did. And I don't want to paint a picture of a young woman who was, like, unremorseful or didn't care, because I did care. But I could tell you that I took as much responsibility as I was emotionally capable of doing at that time in my life, right? Because I had the emotional mentality of a 16-year-old. That's when I started drinking. And... Um, it just seemed to me in the summer of 1993, like every, looking back on it, you know, I know it's been 30 years ago, and it's just, it was an, it's an incredibly long time ago, uh, but some of it is still so fresh as though it happened yesterday, and I had several court appearances, I had like a pretrial and arraignment, and uh, you know, and I'd never been in that kind of trouble before, and I was in the newspapers, I was on TV, um, and in the summer of 1993, when all this was going on, while I was out on bond and all these, all this was happening, I would continue to drink, right? And I see you over there nodding. And you know why? I continued to drink because my thought was, if you had my problems, you'd drink too. Not that I ever needed an excuse to drink. But it was the only thing that, and it didn't even really touch it. Like, I'm just trying, the words that's coming into my mind is salve and, and balm and, like, some kind of elixir just to try to patch that up and, you know, make it feel a little bit better because all I wanted was for, like, five years to pass. <laughs> I don't know what that had to do with anything, but I remember in the summer of 1993, I just wish it was five years from now. Ironically, what would happen for me in five years, but... So... October 19, 1993, Judge Paul Moon in Port Clinton, Ohio, sentenced me to four to ten years in prison. Now, at this hearing, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers turned up. The room was packed. Um, they came down from Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania. I mean, they, they just came from all over and descended on that little courtroom. And the jury box was filled with local media, um, like local TV channels and the local press, uh, every seat, like 12 seats. Uh, that's what was in the jury box. And it was just this big story. And I remember they had me hidden in a broom closet. Um, God. 
um, it was just like this circus, and it was almost like mob justice. You know, like everybody just wanted to see this girl fry. And um, so I was in this mob closet. And um, they led me in and set me at the table for my sentencing, and the only person I wanted with me was my mom. And when that judge gave me that sentence, he took my driver's license for the rest of my life. He said, you'll never drive in the state of Ohio or any of the other 50 states. I'm going to give you four to ten years in prison. And then he pr proceeded to take my inventory for like five minutes. Um, I don't know if it was a show for all the people that were there. or it, And I felt like it, in the moment he meant it what a god-awful person I was, and you're a menace to society, and people like you don't belong on the streets, and you're never going to drive again, and, and it just was on and on and on. And, um, like, he was kind of really just validating all the things I already thought about myself, right? You know, he's publicly doing it, and it's getting recorded by the media, and, like, everybody, so we all are on the same page that this woman is, in fact, the scum of the earth. I've been there. Like, I know. And, and it had to get worse than that, right? So after he sentenced me, after, you know how they have that hammer and they bang that gamble really hard, and he did that, and you could have heard a pin drop, and then my mother just let out this scream, this blood-curling scream, you know, because her youngest daughter was being led away in handcuffs to prison. And then this other woman, the boy's mom, was also sobbing hysterically. And I'm ashamed to report to you that I didn't have an ounce of compassion for either one of those women because all I could think was, let's get out of this room. I just wanted to get on the other side of that door, and I didn't even care what was over there. I just couldn't take another minute in that room with that energy. And um, so they led me over to the county jail, and <clears throat> I ended up a week later, a sheriff came, and they drove me down to Marysville in central Ohio, a maximum security for prison for women in the state of Ohio, and they dropped me off. And there I was, surrounded by 2,000 women, the worst of the worst in the state of Ohio. I don't even like women. And <laughs> and my biggest crime was flirting with a guy for a free beer. Like, I didn't even, like, I wasn't, like, a shoplifter. Like, I didn't, I mean, I might have been a speeder, you know. I mean, I, when I think back about the laws that I broke, and I, I'm a drunk. I did what we do. We get DUIs, we break up relationships and marriages, and... We neglect our children, and we end up in jail, and, you know, that's, that was, that's my story. I did all those things. Did them all. And so now I'm in this maximum security prison for women, and I am totally outside of my league. Like, they, I have never seen, I had never met women like this before. And I had this thing inside my head, <sighs> I think it was a coping mechanism, but the thing was, you're not like them. You're, 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 not, you're not that bad, right? I don't belong. And then, see, then that start, stuff starts. I don't belong here. That was an accident, right? This is the stuff, and I can't look at it. Like, I don't look at what I did. I don't talk about what I did. None of the other inmates knew because... In Ohio, I don't know what it's like where you come from, but in Ohio, if you are a female inmate in a women's prison and you've harmed a child and the other inmates find out that you've harmed a child, <laughs> it's, as, it's as bad as it, I saw it. I know. They stick out their foot and try to trip you. Like, they're just, it, you get taunted. Like, it is horrible. And so I was horrified that they might do that, treat me like that. I, I killed a kid. I, you know, and so I would never talk about my crime. And somewhere along the way, I, I gotta, I gotta preface this story first. So what I did was I started doing my hair and my makeup. Like when I had finally, after I settled in and I had access to 
a hair dryer and some makeup and an iron, you know, and, and so I would iron my khaki pants and have the little creases and I would, you know, do my hair and my makeup and I would fix up the outside so that I could fool you and you would think I was okay on the inside. And I was dying on the inside, man. I was dying. And um, so I walked around up and down those sidewalks like I was just a little bit better. You know, all dolled up every single day. And so somewhere along the way, this rumor circulated that I was incarcerated for embezzlement. Oh, that sounds quite interesting, an embezzlement, huh? Uh, yeah, so someone had conjured up this story, something like uh, I was a high-ranking executive at some these big banks, and I'd embezzled all this money, and I had been traipsing around Europe and whatever. I loved that rumor. Oh, it was wonderful because being a girl that robbed a bank, to me, sounded way much better than being a girl that killed a 14-year-old boy. And um, so anyway, uh, the years are starting to go by. I don't think about what I did. I don't talk about what I did. I don't discuss it with my family. I don't even talk about it with my family. It's like one of those taboo. Anybody else have like that elephant in the living room? We're just not going to talk about that. Maybe it'll go away, right? And, and so we had that in my family. We just didn't talk about it. It was like it was off limits. And so um, they moved me about maybe, I don't know, a year or two in. I don't think it was two years. They moved me from this maximum security prison up to Cleveland, Ohio. Middle of Cleveland, downtown Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland's best kept secret. It's a facility right there about three or four blocks. It's not far from where the, I'm going to say it, Cleveland Indians. <laughs> it's okay to say Indians, right, sweetie? I'm like, right? Say yes. <laughs> okay. Where the Cleveland Indians play baseball and... Um, 650 inmates, all of them came from Marysville. Some of them had committed murder. Some of them had been locked up for 30 years. The only requirement to be housed there was be within four years of seeing the Ohio Pro Board or going home and be a minimum status. Now, murderers can get, get into that category after 30 years, right? And so they moved me up to this pre-release center right there by the on-ramp to the freeway. Um, if you go over by housing units E and F and just stick around long enough, a car will pull up, it'll stop, somebody will walk over by the fence, they'll toss a bag of weed over, and you're like, man, that's so ballsy. Like, I, don't, I, I would never do that, but I watched it over and over, and... Uh, you know, I got up there and I thought, well, God, I could do this. This is nothing like the environment that I just came from, not even remotely close. And so I settled in up at Cleveland and I, I started going to some AA meetings, right? I, I've got this pro hearing coming up and the Ohio Pro Board will see that I've attended some meetings and they might smile on me. Maybe I'll get a free pass. Maybe I'll get to go home early, right? On my four to 10. And so in the winter of 1996, um, there, were, there were lots of inmates there for vehicular homicide, but there was this one girl in particular, her name was Denise, and she, she was from Cleveland, and the victim in her accident was her best friend in the passenger seat, childhood best friend, like always had been best friends. And her, the best friend's mother, who was killed in the accident, her mother wrote a letter to the Ohio Pro Board, encouraged them to let Denise go, because she had to live with that the rest of her life and all that. And um, I remember clearly being uh, standing outside in the cold Cleveland winter, waiting for her to exit from her pro hearing from the B building. And uh, I was out there for a long, long time. Well, there were other inmates having their hearings, so I, you, know, you just weren't allowed in there. And she finally came out, and she was pretty upset. And I said, what just happened in there? And she was hysterical, and she said, they just gave me on my 2 to 10, which was the minimum sentence, they just gave me all 10 years. I said, what? She said, yep, they stripped me of my good days. In fact, I'm not even eligible to be housed here in Cleveland. I, they're taking me back to Marysville today because of it. I was like, oh, oh, my God. And that was like in January or February. And then a month or two later, it happened again with somebody else. And my hearing was coming up in May. And it prompted me to call home. I said, Mom, they're giving the vehicular homicides. are all getting 10 years. 
And, you know, you know, parents, my mom was like, oh, you know, you'll be okay. Don't worry about that. You know, you don't compare yourself to them. You know, maybe more than one person was killed. Maybe, you know, they had multiple prior DUIs. Um, you, you just can't compare yourself. And so I get to my first parole hearing in May of 1996. And it, it lasted, I know it was maybe five minutes. Uh, they clearly had made their decision before I walked in the door, and they gave me all 10 years, day for day, in one fell swoop, stripped me of the good days I had already earned, and set in place that I would never earn another good day. So 10 years meant 10 years, day for day, 10 years, an entire decade. And at that point, I think I had served something like two years and eight months, maybe. And... Um, they take me back to my housing unit, and I get on this orange jumpsuit and pack my stuff. You can't call home because that's a security risk because you're going to be out, you know, in transport. So I couldn't even call my mom. And they took me back down to Marysville and put me in uh, this place called the, the admissions area where you inmates get processed through, but it's got like a sink and a bunk and a toilet, just like you see on TV, like this little tiny picture of your bathroom, a sink, a bunk, and a toilet, and uh, where the bathtub is, a, a bunk. And I was locked in that box for like four days. And um, I couldn't even cry. I couldn't even cry. You know, and I, I think back about that time, what was going on inside of me, and I just, I liken it to the story in the big book where the boy um, whistles in the dark to keep his spirits up, right? And that was me. I was doing that because I was just so incredibly detached from my feelings. Because my alcoholism is a feelings disease. I cannot feel my feelings at any cost. The only thing that comes natural to me and that I easily slip into is anger. Anger or numb. Oh, that's it. There's no in-between. It's I'm either mad or I'm just numb. And so... They gave me a um, a bed out in population, I don't know, Friday. I think I was moved on a Monday, and they gave me a bed on Friday. And uh, they put me in New Cottage. I thought, I remember I looked at that move, so I said, New Cottage? Why would they put me in New Cottage? Let me tell you what New Cottage is. New Cottage is where the lifers live. That's where the women that are doing mega, mega time, they put them together so that you're not constantly saying goodbye to your roommate, right? So they assigned me to New Cottage, and I went, this has got to be a mistake. I remember even asking the sergeant, Sergeant Johnson, are, are they sure they want to put me in New Cottage? Not that I was afraid. I just was so shocked. But I was in denial. I was in total denial that, um, yeah, Terry, you're doing a decade of time. You definitely qualify to be housed in New Cottage. Um, and it was called New Cottage because it was the newest of all the cottages there, and it was built like in 1970, whatever, whatever. Uh, but at least I wasn't in a uh, one of those facilities that had, they had lots of those, a warehouse with a, a bunk and a bunk and a bunk and a bunk and a bunk with like three feet in between them, and they have like 500 women under the same, like a, it's incredible the way they pack them in. And uh, not New Cottage, mm -mm, you just have one roommate with your sink and your bunk and your toilet. <laughs> you have one roommate. And uh, I guess I don't know if I'm trying to glorify that, but um, I guess it could have been worse. And so anyway, I had the staff down there full. They all thought, oh, she's just this nice, sweet girl from the country. Terry's a nice girl. We're going to give her, see, I had a high school diploma. If you've got a high school diploma in the penitentiary, that thing is like gold. You will not flip a soy burger or sling a mop. They will find a real job for you because I had a high school diploma. So they found a real job for me. I worked in the warden's area in the administration building. I had my own office. I answered to Lieutenant Wasmer, uh, and she was the director of the count office. Count office is very important. You know, they count inmates every four or five hours. I mean, uh, nonstop. You're just constantly getting counted. And I had my own office. I had, like, three inmate runners that were assigned to me. Their job was to sit on a pew outside my office, um, and then I was typing these very important documents. I was moving inmates, like, from admissions out into population. I was doing seniority moves from those awful, awful um, rooms full of bunks into the housing units that had just two room, you know, two bunks in it. And uh, one day I typed up all these bed moves, and it was, get, it was late in the day. I know it was after 2 o'clock, and there was a 4 o'clock count. And 
I couldn't find Lieutenant Wasmer anywhere, so I, I zipped over into the tile office. I'm like, Miss Floyd, I got about 40 bed moves here that need to be signed. These girls, if they don't start moving and get into the right rooms and the right beds, the four o'clock count's never going to clear. Could you please sign off on these? And she said, oh, yeah. And I stepped into her air-conditioned office, and she starts signing. And while she's signing, she says, you know, Terry, I've been meaning to talk to you. There's a really good program over at Recovery Services called HEARTS. Have you ever thought about treatment? I said, treatment? Treatment for what? <laughs> right? Like, I worked with this lady every single day, and, you know, I was a little translucent to her. She could see right through me. And, and I want to say that this woman, Miss Floyd, like, she was one of those women whose every lock of hair is in place, her makeup was always perfect. I, she never wore the same dress twice, and, you know, and she went home every night. And she never treated me like an inmate. And she was so nice to me and to everybody. I mean, she was the epitome of the woman that I wanted to be. Like, it was her. Like, I would want to be like her. And um, she's recommending this program. And I was honest with her. I said, Miss Floyd, I said, I've been locked up for five years. Uh, no good days means no good days. I, I, there's nothing in it for me. Like, why, what incentive would I have to do that? And, uh, and I was honest with her because I didn't do programs. I was done. Like, I, five, 10 years means 10 years. Like, I'm not doing your programs. Like, I'm going to go to work. And in the evenings, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then she said the magic words that my ego just loved to hear. She said, well, Terry, you know there's a two-year waiting list for that program. And I can pick up the phone and make a phone call, and I can get you in the next group. I said, sign me up. <laughs> right? Someone has realized how important I am. I'm moving to the top of a two-year waiting list. Isn't that how it should be? <laughs> right? I mean, this is how ego-driven, like, oh, my God. Oh, God. And so she made the phone call. My face feels hot. I got sun-kissed today, didn't I? I? It feels good. I'm from Ohio, and it's we're having winter up there. And it is so beautiful just to sit on that beach. I just feel like my face is on fire. Anyway, I'm sorry about that. I run off on these tangents, too. Forgot to tell you that part. So um, she makes the phone call, and I get put in the next group, which was like three weeks later. And so what they had to do was reassign my job. So now I don't work at the count office anymore. Now I'm a student at Recovery Services. I need to report to the r, &R building Monday through Friday. And I'm there from like 8 a.m. to the 4 o'clock count to the whistle blows, and we go back for count. And... <laughs> It didn't take me long to figure out how terribly I had screwed up. This was an intense behavior modification program, like a six-month program. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even ask her about it. I didn't get any details. I, didn't, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I had this cushy job right next door to the warden, and now I'm sitting around this in a circle of women every day, watching people get their inventory took. It's like, oh. So I want, to, I want to take you guys into that room with me in the HEARTS program. I want to share just a little story real quick to give you a visual of what that was like for me. So there are 15 inmates uh, that are, 14 of us are going through the program, so we're called students. And then the 15th inmate is a, um, a peer leader. Her title is peer leader. She's also an inmate. She's already been through the program. She works for recovery services, and her job is to give feedback. And then the uh, 16th person in the group is a licensed, is a woman, a licensed drug and alcohol counselor that goes home every night. Okay? So... One day, about maybe a weekend, the girl that sat straight across from me, and I, I cannot think of her name, but I can see her face. She was there because she killed her daughter. I know that that's what, because her life was hell. And how she ended up in the same room as me out of 2,000 inmates, here she is across from me in my 14 of us, but there she was. And we're sitting there about a week into the program, and the counselor looked at that girl and said to her, I want you to tell these women what you did to your daughter. Oh, oh my God. I just thought, I, I don't want to listen. I don't think I want to know, for starters. And um, I'm not going to get into all the details, but she told a story, and she did kill her daughter, and it involved hot water. I would only say that much, but... When the way the program was set up, after you share, you receive feedback. So during the feedback process, you place your hands flat on the table, your feet flat on the floor, 
and you listen. You just listen. You might be in that position for two hours listening. You don't get to say a word to anybody as long as your feedback is going on. And I can tell you that they lit her up. Oh, my God. And I mean, at one point, I just, even after what she did and what she admitted to doing, and she, and it was the way that she kind of admitted, like, nonchalantly, like, I brought her into this world, I could take her out. Like, that kind of said that, actually said that. And I kind of felt sorry for her at one point. It got so bad. And, um, but I remember thinking to myself, your turn is coming. There's going to be a day when they ask you about what you did, and you're going to be in the hot seat. And as the days inched on in this program, the more uncomfortable I got because everybody kept getting in the hot seat, and they would call it encounters. You know, they, they would do these encounters, and it's it's kind of like holding a mirror up to somebody, whether they like it or not, and, and having the back of their head right here, and like you will look whether you want to look or not. You're going to look. And so on uh, a week later on Friday, I um, we came back from lunch. We circled up around the table, and the counselor looked at me, and she said, uh, I want you to tell the story about that night that you wrecked your car, you and your sister. Like, she would already had all the details. She already knew. And what's my first thought? First thought is, everybody's going to find out I didn't rob a bank, right? <laughs> That's my first thought. Because it's all about me. Because these these girls are going to go straight out to the yard and say, oh, and by the way, guess what? Terry's not who she, you know, she, and, and I never admitted, I, I was just never denied the rumor, right? I Anyway, that's the first thought that goes through my head. The second thought that goes through my head was, oh, and then um, I just sat up straight and I told a story. And when I told the story, honest to God, it was like there was this uh, video playing inside my head. That I, I mean, I have a memory of what had happened that night. Five years, maybe six, close to six years had passed. And But the, see, the thing was, is I didn't allow myself to think about it. I didn't allow myself to revisit the memory because if the memory popped in my head, I would quick think of something else. Don't, don't think about that because I didn't know what to do with it. It was so big and so ugly, I didn't know what to do with it. It's kind of like that elephant. Like, if you just ignore it long enough, maybe it'll go away, right? And so I told this story um, so incredibly detached. Like, I was just watching the video, the images of what I saw, and I was crying, and I, you know, my mascara was so little smeared, and I tried to put my heart into it, but I was just, just detached, and... You know, they could see through it. You, you can't bullcrap a bullcrapper, right? I mean, and so when it came time for me to get my feedback, I put my hands flat on the table, my feet flat on the floor, and my feedback went something like this. Boy, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you were the victim. And you take no responsibility for what you did to that 14-year-old boy. And I can still see that counselor banging her fist on the table. Do you want to save face or save ass? Because you cannot save both. And I wanted to save both, always, right? I'm trying to save face and save ass, and it's one or the other. It's one or the other. And um, I couldn't believe they were talking to me like that. Like, don't they know who I am? Oh, my God. And then it just seemed like, and it went on for like two hours, and I had my hands, you know, and you get the snot that's hanging off the chin, and, you know, you can't have the tissues. And those encounters just were so messy and uh, at one moment during the course of that afternoon, someone said something, and I wish I could remember what it was so I could give you this brilliant wisdom of, you know, pearl of wisdom, but I don't remember what it was. I just remember I, during all that, because I'm thinking defensive thoughts. My hands are stuck on the table. I'm thinking defensive thoughts, but at one moment I went, oh, my God, what have you done? It was like the wall came down and one of those bullets came through and, you know, and it just a beam of light made its way to my heart and I could see it I saw it from a different angle for the first time like ever and it was so shocking and I remember the next thought that came behind it was this is not the time to get vulnerable because I was under attack and so I put the wall back up real quick I kept staring at that clock I couldn't wait for the four o'clock whistle to blow and when it finally did I jumped up I grabbed my book 
And that counselor looked at me and she said, not so fast. When you get back to your room, I want you to write a letter to that 14-year-old boy. And I want you to bring that letter to group on Monday. And I'm all crying and teary-eyed. and I can't believe they talked to me like that. And, and, I, and I said, well, I don't know what to say. It'll be all wrong. And she's like, I'm not going to tell you what to say. Just write a letter. Bring it to group on Monday. Oh, and one more thing. I want you to wash that makeup off your face. I don't want you ironing your, your uniform. Stop curling your hair. Don't do your makeup for two weeks. I swear to God, if I had had a gun, I'd have shot her. <laughs> I'd have shot her. And I'm afraid of guns. And uh, I, I looked, at, I remember I looked at her and I said, whatever. I was so mad. And I walked out that door and I went back to my bunk. I climbed up. I was on, at that time, I was on a top bunk. I climbed up on the top bunk, and during count time, everybody gets on their bunk. I don't care who you are, where you're at, if you're an inmate, and they call count time, you go get, you get your butt on the bunk. That's what you do all day. And so I go and I get on top bunk, on my bunk, I get a notebook and a pen, and I, I'm raw, okay? Let me just say, I feel like someone has taken like a dull screwdriver and got me right there and just went straight down with it, right? Like I am in a lot of pain. My wounds are exposed to air and sunlight, right? And I'm dying. And I'm up on the bunk and I got this paper, or this notebook and this pen, and I start writing a letter to this kid, this Ron Miller, this 14-year-old boy, right? And I said... You don't get to get your driver's license. You don't get to go to your senior prom. You don't get to graduate from high school. You don't get to marry a wife. Right? Because I have taken all this away from you and so much more. And I got it. On that day, I got it. It took me six years, but I got it. And um, I go back to group on Monday morning, and I, at eight o'clock, and I, I had my letter, and we circled up around the table, and I, I wanted to read my letter. I said, I looked at the counselor. I said, I got my letter. She said, that's good. I said, well, I want to read it. And she said, you will read it. But before we do that, I want to revisit group on Friday. I want you to tell us the story about that night you wrecked your car. But this time, I want you to tell the truth. Man, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I thought, I can't possibly go through that again. And then the next thought was, you know what? Screw it. Give them what they want. I'm never going to see these women again. And just tell the story. And so I sat up straight. I told the story. Now, it was the same story. Right? Same story that I told her. Like the facts of what happened in the road that night will never change. But what changed was um, my perspective, you see, because I don't see things the way that they really are. I see things the way that I am. And the way that I am had shifted from Friday to Monday. And so the story then wasn't pivoted around me and how awful it was for me and what that was like for me. Ironically, without me even consciously realizing I was doing it, the story was about her. It was about the boy's mom. And I saw her. I saw her in the road. I saw her frantic. She was, oh, my God, she was so hysterical. And um, I saw her run away from her car. She ran a good distance, maybe 50 yards. And then she stopped in the road and grabbed her, bent over and grabbed her knees and just let out this blood curling scream. And um, it was just, her only son was bleeding to death in the back seat of her car. And she could not save his life. That's what we do. That's what I did. Oh, God. And, um, so I told the story, and I get done telling the story. I put my hands on the table, and the thought was, oh, I'll just let them rip me up again. Here we go again. And the counselor looked at me, and she said, no, 
before we do the feedback, I would like you to read the letter. So then I read the letter that I had wrote Friday afternoon. And um, when I got done reading that letter and I looked up, there were like 15 other women looking back at me with tears in their eyes, and they had eyes of compassion, right? Like nobody had their claws out. Everybody had um, compassion, and we were all in the same place. Like it, it was like a safe spot to be vulnerable, if that's a way to put it. It was almost like, you know how you have like that dark spot in your soul that I will never ever let anybody into this place. I'm never going to discuss the contents of what's in this room. This will never see the light of day. And it was like, I just opened up the door and I said, okay, we're all going to go down into this place and let's just sit here and feel this. And that is how I healed that. And it wasn't even by my, like, despite my own best efforts, <laughs> to stay stuck and to stay sick and to stay in the rut that I was in, despite all that, for whatever reason, whatever reason, God in his infinite wisdom thought better and put me in a position, right? Because I would have never picked that for myself. I don't even know what's good for me. I swear to God, I don't even know what's good for me. I would have never chose that. And so... The woman that was in the group, I remember I told you there was a peer leader who had already been through the program. Her name was Sheila. And so Sheila and I had got really close. Um, I actually liked her a lot. Sheila had, uh, she had like snow white blonde hair and these, her eyebrows were so blonde you couldn't even see them half the time. And she had like baby, baby blue eyes and she was so, you ever get around those people that are just so peaceful and so soft-spoken? It's like, could you just rub that all over me, please? I just, I just want to be like that. I want to be just like you. And she had that, and she was an inmate. Like, she was doing 3 of 15 for shooting her husband in the leg during a blackout. She's, and <laughs> bless his heart, I know he qualifies for Elanon. He'd come every Saturday. He came. <laughs> he never missed a beat, honey. He kept her book stuck full of money. She always had lots of food. And, uh... But Sheila, Sheila changed. I, I don't know. I didn't know Sheila before. I only knew the Sheila that I had met who had come out of the same program and who had found a God and who was, you know, that's the only Sheila I knew. And so we would sit out in the yard. And I remember one day we were talking, we were having this conversation about God. And uh, I was not comfortable at all with that conversation. I, didn't, I don't want to talk about God. What am I talking about God for? And so we were getting into the steps a little bit, and we're talking about step two, and, you know, and she's asking me my thoughts and my feelings and my understanding of God. I'm like, well, I, if, there, if a God is real, if he really does exist, I'm frying in hell. So that's really all I need to say about that. And she was like, oh, Terry, really? And I said, uh, I said, uh, Sheila, I said, what kind of a God I mean, I had this, obviously, animosity and a resentment toward God. What kind of a God would have let um, that boy die in the car in the accident that night? Why didn't I die? Like, why, why him? She said, what? I can't believe you're asking that question. You need to rephrase that. What kind of a 28-year-old woman would get behind the wheel of her car drunk and put in jeopardy the lives of everybody else on the road? That's what you need to be asking. I said, well, you know what, that's, that's fair enough, I'll give you that. Um, what kind of a God would let the babies in Ethiopia starve, right? Right? And I'm trying to get her to see my way. And She said, you blame that on God? I said, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I do. He could, like, make banana trees grow or something. Like, he's God. Like, he could, you know, and she said, I want to tell you something. There is no dearth of food on this planet. There is enough food that nobody ever has to go to bed hungry. So don't ask what kind of God would let the baby starve. You need to ask what kind of people. Because the problem isn't that we don't have food. It's that we don't distribute the food. We hoard food. That's what we do. And when she said that, it was like, I was like, I had this epiphany. I was like, oh, my God. Like, I blame God for everything. But how does God work? What? Through people, right? God works through people. 
He's not going to just appear right there in that chair because if he did, then that was how that would be my limit, my limited view of God. God it looks like that and appears in this city in that chair, and that would be my experience of God. And so she was she was so brilliant. She said, uh, "Well, where do you think God is?" A brilliant question for a girl like me. I, gosh, I've never thought about that. I. I suppose God's in heaven. That made sense to me. And she said, oh, that's good. Well, where do you think heaven is? Gosh, I I don't know. I suppose it's up there, out there somewhere. That's good. What do you think he's doing? Godding? I don't know. <laughs> like, what does God do? I don't know. He's like making the earth go around the sun and turning, you know, embryos into babies and acorns into oak trees and you know all that kind of stuff. He's got him. You know, he doesn't have time for a schmuck like me. And uh, so anyway, the conversation goes on and I'm just fighting every step of the way. And she just gave me she gave me a really simple assignment. She said, um, Terry, I want you to start saying a simple prayer every day. Say it in the morning when you get up, and say it at the end of the day when you go to bed. Simple, simple prayer. Dear God, please direct my thoughts, my words, and my deeds. Just that. That's all you got to say. I'm like, well, that seems silly. Okay. So I did it. I started doing it. I did it in the morning, and I did it in the night. Like a month passed. We're sitting out in the yard. She's asking me, have you been doing that? I said, yeah. What do you think? Are you, I'm like, I feel like I'm talking to the wall. It's weird and awkward. And she said, good, you just keep doing that. And so I just kept doing that. And uh, despite my best efforts, again, once again, but see, I followed some simple instruction, just a little tiny, itty-bitty simple instruction. And the only reason I followed it was because I wanted what Sheila had. I wanted to be like her. I wanted that peace, that serenity, and that sense of calm that she just exuded everywhere she went. I wanted to be like that. And so, anyway, um, a week or two later, I am, was not one to sit around and read books. Not, not before that. I have, was after this. But I ended up in the library. And this book that had a really pretty cover caught my attention. And I looked over. And it was actually currently on the New York Times bestseller list. But it, the book was on it for a very, very long time. And not just in the United States, in multiple countries around the world. And there it was. And all the other books were about 40 years old. But here was this book, this one book, that was currently on the New York Times bestseller list. So I, I took it back to my um, bunk, and I, I read that book in less than 24 hours. I could not set it down. It was uh, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And it introduced me to a God that I could fall in love with, that I could um, wrap my brain around, because uh, my brain is just doesn't, <coughs> if it doesn't make sense, I'll be the first one to kick it out. Like, it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense and I can't explain it, it's got to go, or I need to rework it until I can get it to make sense. And so I was able to rework that. And thank God, like, if I would have been right, if God really was up there, out there somewhere, if I was right, thank God I was wrong. <laughs> But if I was right, that would have meant that God and I were separate. He's up there, out there. I'm down here. There's a space in between us, right? He's there. I'm here. But what I found out after reading the book and, and doing my own, my own journey in my own heart, I found out that God is right here inside me and inside you and you and you. And God is inside all of us. And I, the evidence is like tonight when we go to bed, everybody's fingernails will grow just a little bit, right? And our hair is going to grow just a little bit except for my sweetie. Um, <laughs> not his, but that's okay. And so there's this thing inside of all of us. So like there's this energy, right? There's this energy that flows, and it's in all of us. And it's, it's got us connected. We're all connected, right? And so one of the things that I've done in recovery is to get into the stream of that, right? Stop trying to fight and swim upstream. I saw the most interesting thing this morning. I was down at the beach... This just popped into my head, so I must need to share it. I was down at the beach, and there was this guy. He appeared to be a local. He was walking the beach, and it looked to me, I don't know about the tide. I, don't, I even asked Eric, is it coming in or going out? Like, I don't know if it's coming or going, but it's doing something. And this guy was walking the beach, and every time the water would slosh back, he'd be looking and looking and looking, and I thought, gosh, I wonder if he dropped something. And then he got made it further on, and he just kept going, and I thought, oh, He's looking for something shiny. 
I see what he's doing. And then the next thought was, you know what? He's looking in the wrong place. You aren't going to find shiny, happy stuff out there somewhere. You're going to find it here. Isn't that interesting? And then that thought just popped into my head today when I saw him combing the beach for something shiny. But anyway, so I don't know how much time do I have left. I, I feel like I've been up here forever. <laughs> Am I good? Okay, I'll just keep talking until someone tells me to shut up. Um, so I grew up in Woodville, Ohio. Um, no, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Um, so let's just get, let's go, like, I guess we should probably try to get out of prison so we can wrap this thing up. So I've been in jail a long time. So I ended up um, back at the Northeast Pre-Release Center uh, uh, with, like, two years left on my sentence. I, I had done, like, eight years, and I was in a totally different spot. Uh, I, I thought differently. I spoke differently. I treated people differently. Like, the miracles of Alcoholics Anonymous were really manifesting in my life, and I was truly, truly free on the inside. I may have been locked up, but I was truly free on the inside. And my life had, was beginning to change, like things were getting better, uh, because I was at peace with myself, and I had come to a place of peace with what had happened. And um, so I get up to the Northeast Pre-Release Center, as soon as I got there, I went over to Recovery Services, and I said to Ms. Daniels, um, do you have any um, books in recovery? Like, what do you have? Um, do you have any tapes? Do you have? And she walked over to the shelf, and she pulled down this big box. It was a like 10 cassette tapes. I'm really dating myself here. 10 cassette tapes of a weekend that was recorded in San Sacramento, California, and it was the Joe and Charlie tapes. True story. And she didn't even know what it was. I'd never heard of it. And so she hands that to me, and she says, um, maybe you'll find this helpful. And I said, oh, okay. So I trotted back to my little housing unit, and at the 4 o'clock count, I thought, you know, I guess I'll check that out, see what that is. And I put in the first cassette and put on my little headphones, and right away, I mean, I swear to God, I wasn't 30 seconds in. I thought, oh, my God, I've, I've got a little pot of gold here. And so these Joe and Charlie tapes would be in my possession for two years until the day. Well, I got out on a Sunday, so I turned them in on Friday because she was only there on weekdays. And um, with those tapes, I was able to go through the first 164 pages multiple, multiple times. Uh, if you said to me, who was your first sponsor? I would say well, it was Joe and Charlie. Yeah. Who took you through the steps the first time? It was Joe and Charlie. And that big book that I had during the last, the end of my incarceration, you should see, like I still have it today, like the binding is busted. It, and when you open it up, there's like pink and yellow and green, like all different, you can see all the different times I went through it and the notes off on the side and, and it looks like a big book is supposed to look, right? And so I had that and um, I was going to meetings and it was just really, really preparing myself and I didn't know what home life was going to look like. I didn't know exactly where I was going to go. My father had died, so I had a little bit of money in the bank. And uh, so I had that, that was a comfort, knowing that I, you know, I was not going to have to beg or starve. Um, <laughs> and I had my mom, you know. And so my big day came. It was uh, on a Sunday in 2003, October of 2003. All the leaves were turning. The air was crisp and cool. And it was 8 o'clock in the morning. My mom was out in the parking lot, and I... I remember I walked up, but the gate buzzed, and I had um, my TV in my hands, that beat up big book, and an envelope of pictures. And I remember thinking to myself when I heard that buzz, oh my God, this is where the rubber meets the road. Did you mean what you said? Did I get enough work done? Is there something left undone that I need to be doing? And the answer is yes. Like, I need to get to an AA meeting, and it's urgent. Like, I need to go today. And Miss Daniels, on Friday, when I had taken the tapes back, gave me the number for my local central office in Toledo, Ohio. And I had enough insight that when I got home that day, I called that number, and they sent someone to me that night, and I was able to get to a meeting in my area the day that I got home. And I, that was so critical. I think that's so critical for any inmate. And I don't care how solid your foundation is. Like, we really need a new set. I need a new group of women. I need cheerleaders. I need people who believe in me because my community didn't necessarily believe in me. Like, I had to re-earn the trust of my community. I had to re-earn, you know, and, and, and I get it. I took a job at the local grocery store scanning groceries when I first came home. 
Um, I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have a car. Um, I didn't really have, like, there wasn't not, nothing else to do, really. <laughs> they offered me this job, and so I took it. And uh, a lot of people would come in there to buy their gallon of milk, and, you know, I raised a lot of eyebrows. Like, people would come in and, aren't you Terry? Yeah, I am, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wouldn't say anything, but you could just see, like, the energy. I, could, I could read energy. And so... About four or five months into it, like, I wasn't going to the bar. I wasn't out drinking. I wasn't sleeping with men. Like, I wasn't, I was going to meetings, going to work, going to meetings, going to work. Like, I was about my business. And after a while, it was your conduct. Like, I never said, I've changed. You guys, you should give me another chance. Like, I've changed. I didn't have to say that because my conduct said it, right? And so that's kind of the place that I was in, was that my conduct had said it. And so about four or five months after I got home, the eye doctor across the street, um, the optometrist is the doctor, and the optician is the pharmacist for the eye doctor. They, The optician fills the prescriptions after the eye exam, and he was going to hire someone to help his brother. The optician had, uh, his young, his older brother had polio and drug a leg, and he, had, he was in his 60s, and he had a lot of health issues, and they were going to hire someone to help Bill. And so... Uh, one of my friends, two, actually a couple different people came in and said, oh my God, they're going to hire someone across the street. You should go apply. And I thought, what doctor in their right mind would hire an ex-felon, especially someone that did time like I did? And uh, then I made the mistake of telling Linda, <laughs> the woman from the meeting that I had met, uh, and that I, I was running around with her, actually. And uh, she cornered me one day. She goes, what happened when you went over to the eye doctor? I said, oh, I'm not going to waste his time. Why? No. And she said, well, I'm going to give you until Wednesday. When I when we connect Wednesday night for the meeting, you're going to tell me how it went. I was like, ugh. So I got, I got myself together one day after work. I got off at 2 o'clock. I walked across the street. I walked in the eye doctor. I said, I understand you guys are going to hire somebody. I'd like to apply for the position. But before I do that, uh, there's something I've got to tell you. That old man, he was in there by himself. It was the, um, the optician with the polo, polio on his leg. Uh, he drug his leg. And uh, he jumped up out of that chair, and he said, Oh, for Pete's sakes, I already know about that. I've been waiting on you for two months. Where have you been? Scared me half to death. <laughs> I swear to God, scared me half to death. And um, they were going to hire me. Him and his brother, like, because, you know why? Because him and his brother, the doctor, were saying to the patients, who are residents of the village of Woodville mostly, We're going to hire someone to help Bill. Who would you recommend? Do you know anybody needs a good job? Who would you recommend? And people kept saying, there's a girl across the street scanning groceries that would probably do really good over here. And so my community was endorsing me, and they knew all about me. They were just waiting for me to come walking in. And they actually had sent a couple people over there. And Lou, who had mentioned the job to me, they had sent her. Tell that girl across the street to come apply. And do you see how I've got fear holding me back and the Holy Spirit had already gone before me and made a crooked way straight? You see that? Fear is just, it's a liar. It's just a liar. And so I got this really good job. Um, I thought it was, you know, working for a local eye doctor. And shortly into my, maybe two years into my employment, uh, the man that trained me got sick, really sick, and uh, died. Uh, I won't get into those details, but... So after Bill's funeral, Dr. Lobb approached me. He's like, I need you to be licensed. You need to be a licensed optician by the state of Ohio. You're going to study this, and you're going to go down to Columbus in uh, May and take a test. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And I was just so freaked out because, you know, I didn't do well in school. But guess what? I didn't do well in school because I never tried. I didn't care. I didn't care. And so when I had this, these books and I sat down and I tried, I was like, oh, my God. Like, I mean, I worked at it. It didn't just, I didn't just wake up with all that knowledge in my head. But I went down there and I got an A on that test. I got an A. I am a licensed optician in the state of Ohio. And it's because of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I ran into Eric at the grocery store. And um, he's like, hey, you want to go out to dinner Saturday? And I'm like, God, I haven't been on a date in over a decade. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> He's like, when, and I've known him my entire life, right? And I knew he was safe. His mom was my English teacher. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So, you know, I had started dating Eric, and uh, then we ended up getting married a couple years later. And then um, one day, and i gotta, I got to share these stories, and I'm going to wrap it up. Um, 
I had found out that there was a remedy for my driver license situation because I started speaking, right? I started speaking like this, and, you know, I live down near past Toledo, and someone would have to drive me up to Detroit Metro Airport on Friday, then dead head back, and then Sunday they have to drive back up there and get me and then come back down, and it was just the whole driver's license thing really got to be a huge inconvenience, not just for me, but for the people in my inner circle that loved me and that were trying to help me change my life and, and um, to get to where I needed to be, as particularly his mom, Eric and his mom especially. And so this, I found this thing, and it said, um, you know, it was new. It had just went on the Ohio books like January 1st, and, and it was new, and it said if the offender has, if 15 years have passed, tick. You know, and if the offender was drunk or under the influence of drugs, if they've had treatment, tick. You know, and if the, and there was like all this whole list of this criteria that you could file if you met this whole criteria. And I, I, there were like 15 things. I met them all. So I printed it. I took it home. I showed it to Eric. And he's like, oh, I think we need to get an attorney. So I ended up with this attorney, a member of the AA program, right? I taught, just God has just worked so much in my life, and um, I'm going to try to abbreviate this story. Usually it's a little bit longer, but I feel like I'm running over tonight, so I'm going to abbreviate this. He um, said to me, I need you to fill the courtroom, pack it solid. I thought, oh, God, okay. So when I go to AA meetings, like before and after the meeting, would you, would you come and support me at my hearing? And I even had these little pieces of paper that had the date and the location and the time of my hearing. <laughs> this is where I need you to be. I need you to come to this place. And they did. Like, oh, my God. Like, well, I remember it was like there were so many people there. They didn't even have enough seats for everybody. And I show up at the hearing, and it looked just like it did in 1993, a packed courtroom. But it was the other side. They were all there to support me. And I just don't know, like, did I deserve that, you know? And um, so the boy's mom was there, and she got on the witness stand. And under oath, she said, I know, I know for a fact that that woman still drinks and drugs. And you cannot put public safety at risk. Do not restore her driving privileges. And she sure did. And the old Terry would have been sitting at that defendant's table, screaming on the inside, no, that's not true. But I didn't do that. I listened to her. I listened to what she had to say because it's not for me to say how long her grieving process should last or if she should ever even forgive me. Like, she can say things about me that are pleasing to her. And it was pleasing to her to say that. And I am okay with that. And so... At the end of that hearing, um, I didn't get my driver's license back. I got an ankle monitor, um, and I wore that thing. I don't know. I, I feel several months. I wore it for several months, and it was, it was still warm out. And people say, oh, my God, what is it? It was like a, the size of a pack of cigarettes on this band. People would say, what is that on your – I said, oh, that's just my house payment. Because <laughs> that's about what it cost uh, to have it. And um, so I did that for several months, and then I switched to breathalyzers um, – and I was doing the breathalyzers. Like, do I have 10 minutes? No? Okay, perfect. And so, anyway, um, I go back after a couple years of uh, doing breathalyzers, and the judge restored my driving privileges. And, uh, yeah, like, I come and go as I please. And that's because of AA, again, the miracles that happen if you stick around. And I just want to share this real quick story, and I know I'm over time, so I'm just going to share this quick story. Um, in... Uh, that year in September, uh, weird, bizarre set of uh, coincidences kept happening. Every time I'd go somewhere at a meeting, somebody would say, "Well, I had a chance to go to my mama's grave, and leave um, my coin uh, on her headstone while I was in Florida. I had an opportunity at my uncle's funeral to give my six-month coin. I put it in his hand. I had an opportunity, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, God, are you trying to tell me something? Nope, nope, I didn't hear anything because I didn't want to hear anything. And see, I'd never been to that boy's grave, but now I have a driver's license because I would never have someone take me there. I always said that, but I would drive there. I used to say that. I would drive there, but I would never have anybody drive because I'd be too embarrassed, right, to make my amends with someone watching me at his grave. And so I, about a month later then, this kid from Tennessee who had did the same thing I did, heard my CD, haunted me down on Facebook with the limited information I give about myself, and he said, Terry, uh, here's a link to my story. I just want you to know, like, you know, I've listened to your story, and it, it helped me. Thank you. And I 
I said, oh, you're welcome. And, and then uh, a week later, he messaged me again, and he's like, uh, oh, by the way, uh, part of my sentence is i got to go to my victim's grave on the anniversary of the accident once a year, every year, for 15 years, because his wife requested it, and the judge ordered it, and tomorrow's the day. Is, and I'm like, oh, my God. I thought it was a brilliant sentence, but I thought, this is a weird coincidence. And so um, I said, oh, and I told him all the things I would do if I had the courage to do what this kid was getting ready to do tomorrow. And I was out of town that week, and I gave him my phone number. I said, you call me when you get done. And I said, we'll process it together. I'll make myself available from 2 to 6. You call me. And that kid called me the next day, and I was hanging on his every word, asking him, what did you feel like? Now, what do you feel like now? What was it like when you, you know, and he had no, see, he thought I was helping him. He had no idea what he was about to do for me. And then about a week later, um, I got my, I celebrated 20 years of sobriety. And I had this extra 20, I had a 20 year coin. And then the thought occurred to me, oh, you should take this to the boy's grave. I thought, oh, no, why would I do that? I'm a, I, it's my 20 year coin. I've got this little glass dish that starting at year 10, I don't even have one through nine. I starting it and I'm not doing that. And then within four or five days, I had like six of them because everybody word got around. I celebrated. So people were giving me their 20 year coin. I'm like, real funny, God. And so I put one in the car just in case. Right. And then the clincher came. Here's this. This is the end here. I was at a training in Perrysburg a week later. And uh, it was optical training, and the guy had put up all these transition lenses, and there was like 40 opticians in the room. And the guy, um, he gave us all this this lecture and gave them the smokers a smoke break. We come back from the smoke break, break, and he put these five transition lenses up on the board, the ones that are available on the U.S. market. He said, take a piece of paper, number it one through five, identify these lenses, which is which. <sighs> I wasn't even paying attention like I usually don't because I was thinking about how close I am to the cemetery. Maybe I should swing by there on my way home, blah, 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 blah. And so, um, and then I thought, gosh, I would need five, I would need $15 anyway. And I know I'm sure I don't have any cash. Now, why would I need $15? But uh, any old excuse will do. And so uh, he gives us this quiz, 30 opticians in the room. I'm the only one that got it right. And for getting it right, that an instructor walked over to the table where I was sitting. He laid on the desk in front of me three $5 bills. I swear to God. I swear to God. And I looked up, and there was one of those. This was a room like this, a big ballroom with the big chandeliers, a huge, giant chandelier just slightly uh, north of me to the west. And I thought, God, please don't drop that thing on my head. I will go as soon as we're done here, and I got in my car, and I took that $15, and I drove next door to Walmart, and I bought a, a spray of flowers that would go on top of the headstone, and I went out to that boy's grave, and I made an amends. And it was the right thing to do. And it was 20 years in the making, and I told him how sorry I was, and I told him how many people know his story, because this is not my story, this is his story, and that Lives might be changed because of him, and that he did make a difference. And um, anyway, um, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna close with this. I, I every time I step up to the microphone and I share my experience, strength, and hope, I move just a little bit closer to my amends. So I just want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.